Time now for Focus. And the French Overseas Territory of New Caledonia is gearing up for a vote on whether or not it wants to remain part of France. The referendum comes after three decades of talks over the question that were sparked after a violent hostage crisis in the 1980s. At the time, pro-independence militants attacked a police station on Ovi Island and took hostages and barricaded themselves into a nearby grotto. France Tree's Julien Gasparato takes a look back at the turning point in New Caledonia's history with or Peter O'Brien. An island haunted by a tragedy. Dans l'affaire d'Ouvera, les politiques ont failli. A hostage crisis which ended up a bloodbath. Je ne regrette rien. Sinon, euh, les morts. 19 Kanak independentists and six French soldiers killed. On ressent toujours la douleur. Ça va toujours graver dans leur cœur ce qui s'est passé. Je me pose toujours la question. Qu'est-ce qu'on aurait pu faire d'autre? What happened shook the whole of France, which was in the middle of a presidential election. In April 1988, violence and disorder in the French overseas territory of New Caledonia came to a head. On the 22nd, gendarmes on the island of Ouvia were attacked by pro-independence militants. Four were killed and 27 taken hostage. Some of the militants say the operation was not supposed to be violent. The objective was to bring down the French flag and hoist the Kanak flag, to immobilize the gendarmes until that point at the end of the day. When the gendarmes started to panic, they opened fire. Then the militants started shooting everywhere. The drama disrupted a presidential election run between President François Mitterrand and his prime minister, Jacques Chirac. They called in the army and asked General Jacques Fidel to supervise the operation. Chirac told me, I've done Algeria, I know this kind of situation. I've got on my desk a map of Ouvia Island, which isn't very big. So find me these hostages and quickly. Paris sent a swarm of men from several elite units. The island was declared a military zone and forbidden to journalists. The army was everywhere. Helicopters, trucks. It's the kind of stuff you'd see in a war movie. Never would we have thought there'd be so many soldiers deployed here. Philippe Le Gorgeux was in charge of the GIGN special forces there, and he doesn't understand why the army was brought in. The gendarmerie should have dealt with it. It was as if France was declaring war on a bit of its territory. In the north of the island, 16 gendarmes were being kept in a cave in the middle of the forest. It took four days to find them. First contact with the hostage takers was difficult, as these radio exchanges reveal. Je lui ai transmis message de capitaine Philippe, précisant de ne pas progresser sur lui, car négociation tendue par lui. Euh, ah, c'est très bien. Bon, il, la négociation paraît très très dure. Hein as the days went by, information coming from the cave was confused and contradictory. Jacques Chirac didn't want to wait any longer and ordered an assault. He said, General, do you think an operation is possible? I said, yes, it's possible, but difficult and risky. Then he said, what do you think Margaret Thatcher or the Israelis would do? I said, they would go ahead. Then he said, we'll do it. François Mitterrand hesitated, but ended up giving his consent. Because the military and the prime minister wanted to give this order, Mitterrand told me if he gave a counter order, we would be in disarray and have even worse a crisis on our hands. On the morning of the 5th of May, the assault began. The militants were heavily armed and fighting was intense. Seven hours later, all hostages had been liberated, but at a heavy cost. 19 hostage takers and two of the recovery team were killed. Chirac's government accepted the result without hesitation. You can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. Complaining about it won't do anything. When negotiations have failed and you've done everything you could, the only option left is to use force. The attack was launched three days before the runoff vote in the presidential election, and people were soon asking whether the political context had provoked it. In the first round of the elections, the outcome was already clear. Jacques Chirac had lost. Not for one moment did this presidential election have an influence on the hostage liberation. I don't believe this for a second. 
It was the end of a period where the president and the prime minister were from different parties. Prime Minister Chirac was using all means necessary to score points because he knew he was behind in polls. He had to do anything he could, even if it was reckless. Commander Le Gourjou is convinced that with more time to negotiate, a bloodbath could have been avoided. He blames both the president and the prime minister. Mitterrand took the final decision, but he was strongly pressured by the prime minister. I can't say which of them is more responsible. For me, they both are. In another controversy, some of the independentists might have been killed after they had surrendered, something French authorities have always denied. Jonas Adeda, who was in the cave, is convinced his leader Wenceslas Lavalois was executed. We were back to back when we surrendered. Then they said to him, ah, it's you, Lavalois, the Rambo. So they took him and he told me, brother, I'm gone, I know it. Those were the last words he said to me. That's when I heard a gunshot. I heard screaming. Two months later, the Matignon agreements would provide amnesty for those involved in the incident, and they prohibited any trial into what exactly led to the deaths on Ouvier.